So here she is, here is the marvellous Taz Thornton, um, all the way from up Lincolnshire way with her fabulous pink hair. I'm extremely jealous, Taz, because, you know, <laughs> like the world, the world and his mother, you know, lockdown is causing the greyness to come through. Oh, I wouldn't worry. It's causing my blondness to come through. But where I've topped it up, my blonde looks really dark. It's like, oh, it does, doesn't it? Yeah. yeah, we're all in the same boat. So good. Yeah, we are. <laughs> So, um, as you know, Taz, um, thank you so much for joining me because I know that you're such a busy lady. I know Taz through all sorts of different ways and I've done some work and some coaching with Taz and been in one of her fabulous groups uh, for about a year now. Um, and so I know the marvellousness that she is. <laughs> but I also know that um, things have not always been so easy for Taz. And I brought her on today because... We are doing this series on domestic violence, um, particularly, or domestic abuse, particularly because of lockdown and because we are trying to create awareness through the Spot the Signs campaign. Um, and I know that Taz has an extraordinary story. So um, Taz, first of all, uh, would you mind just explain to us a little bit about the background of how this all started for you, how old you were, where you were working and what life was like? Yeah, of course. Uh, I was in a relationship in my early 20s with somebody that I'd known and been in and out of a relationship with since school. One of those safe things. Um, and the behaviour got worse over time. It was subtle. Um, and there was a spike. It started to spike before we moved in together. So it was, I put it down to nerves. Um, I was news editor of a series of newspapers for a local newspaper group at the time. Um, on paper, I was the goal setter. I had the broad shoulders. Everybody came to me with the, with the problems, with the issues, with the challenges. And I didn't really tell anybody what was going on because I didn't know how to. Because, you know, with, with our generation, if we go back that far, back to when everything was in, was in sepia when I was in my 20s. <laughs> I remember growing up and being told that if somebody hits you, you get out. And the kind of abuse that I was going through that, that gradually became desperately difficult was physical, emotional, sexual. And I genuinely used to pray that it just punched me because then I knew what to do. Mm. So that red flag, which was the, um, it, the escalation, mm. you know, I hear this all the time that, you're kind of making excuses for the other person. Oh, yeah. mm. Absolutely. Um, and even when I was concerned, my mum would make excuses. My my mum loved him to bits. Mm. And she'd make excuses for him too. Because, oh, he's such a lovely, lovely big ox of a man. Isn't he wonderful? And he was, and he is, and I'm sure he is now. And I, I believe he's with somebody else. I hope they're very, very happy. I hope he learned his lessons as I did. I don't. I genuinely don't hold on to any ill feeling now at all. Um, but I think we do make excuses, and particularly because of the age I was at the time, and because again I'd been with him on and off since school. You know, I had other, I'd had other boyfriends. I hadn't come out at that stage, or still, you know, the only gay in the village, and you can't possibly talk about these things. And it was a perversion, and you just don't. All of that stuff that you get growing up in the a tiny village mentality um and so i really had no benchmarks even even when it came to some of the kind of sexual abuse that that now with more age and experience i can look back and go god you let somebody do that and again i'm still using the word let mm -hmm. somebody do that but i had no benchmarks so of course there were all those question marks going on in my head is this normal is it am i just being frigid should this be be run-of-the-mill stuff you know and is that, is, do you think that had anything to do with your confusion or of your, of your sexuality? Did you know, for example, that you were gay? Hindsight's a wonderful thing. I you can know. look back and think, Taj, you knew you were gay when you were about six, probably. You know, when I was a kid and saying things like, I wish I was a boy. Or, Why can't I wear jeans and be scruffy and climb trees like that? I did climb trees. Mm -hmm. I can look back now and say, yeah. I can even look back and think, well, you stayed with them initially because you thought it would keep you straight. Yeah. Um, but I remember at the time believing that I wouldn't find anybody else that was acceptable, that I trusted enough and I would love enough outside of this relationship. And we got on pretty well. And there was a lot of love there. I was in love with him. Mm. Um, 
but if, but if I'm honest, if we if we go down to kind of sexual attraction, I don't remember ever having been sexually sexually attracted to a man. Mm. Um, but I was still again because of the area I grew up in, and because of the the, the familial views I grew up with, it was very much that that to be attracted to somebody of the same gender gender was very wrong, and you just don't do it. And plus again small mind mentality at the time i'd look around at other people who we knew were were were, were gay lesbian however they wanted to identify and think, well i can't be because i don't look like that <laughs> i still i like pretty things i still have skirts and dresses i have them now you know I, I like i don't want to look like that so i can't be so therefore if i settle for this relationship where there is love where i'm happy where i know i'll be taken care of then that will keep me on the straight and narrow and I'll be happy and, and live out my life like anybody else. Yeah. So, I mean, the, the confusion over sexuality added on to what actually happens with you is, is not actually related. It just so happens no, that, not it at was, all. you know, it was not at all. it happened at the same time, but it wasn't yeah. related. And I have had people in the past say, well, oh, well, it was that that turned you gay then. No, going through abuse does not make somebody gay. That doesn't happen. It might put someone into a state of confusion where they feel that they can't trust someone of the gender who meted out the abuse. Mm. But, it, but going through abuse is not going to inherently make someone homosexual. So let's just draw a line under that. Anybody's listening and thinking, well, that's what turned her no actually that was there all along but i didn't feel able to follow through on, on my very natural feelings at the time and what i'm hearing is actually because you were gay <laughs> yeah um the comfort and and because you couldn't come out because of, of as you explained you know you're in this you know the only gay in the village scenario actually you probably put up with that abuse longer than perhaps you would have done otherwise Yes. And in some ways, yeah, in some ways, I think it fed into it because the, the friendship I had with him was, was at a point where he, he clocked that I clearly did like, like, like girls. Right. Um, but of course, there was no other way I could explain it at the time than to say I was a bit by curious, as they'd say now, <laughs> by now, gay later. You know? <laughs> um, and in some ways that fed into some of the emotional abuse because once he had that, then he was, out, he, he started trying to, he'd push for things like he'd want to, he'd want threesomes. Not on my bag. No, for me, I'm terribly old fashioned. One of my friends once joked that I had a Victorian vagina. <laughs> <laughs> so I'm terribly, terribly old fashioned for me. Sex comes from love and that was, I don't begrudge anybody who loves to get out there and get it on and have a good time. That's fine. But for me, the act of sex and, and anything vaguely sexy is an extension of love. So I'm very much, you find that person that, that you are in love with and that you want to settle down with. And the physical relationship grows out of that. Mm. Whereas he very obviously had a much higher sex drive than me and a much higher level of kink than me. And wanted to bring in a, lot, in a lot of stuff that I was desperately uncomfortable with. Which is, again, not to take that away from anyone. Where, where that's your thing, that's fine. I genuinely don't care. It's just not mine. Um, was, this so, just, was this just another thing that he could hold against you, if you like, and make you feel ashamed about or guilty about or confused I don't about? think it was ever about him trying to make me feel ashamed or guilty. I think on some level, on some warped level, he was trying to prove himself uh -huh. to somebody in his wider circle and mm -hmm. even if he never told them what was going on there was always i always felt there was a sense that he was trying to prove something um whether that was the more extreme he became the more he felt manly wow I think. wow um, and how extreme did it get um it got to the point well, without going into graphic detail, because nobody needs that, and I'm okay talking with it, but I don't want to be upsetting people listening. I remember one particular occasion where um, I was told I was face down into the bed and trying to push off and, and in pain. I'm trying to get out of that situation and being told there's no point you squirming about and trying to push me off because the more you the more you try and push me off, the more it turns me on. Mm -hmm. And when I was able to move afterwards, let's just say there was blood on the sheets and I was told to stop crying because he was trying to go to sleep. And nobody knew about this at that, at its very worst, still nobody knew. 
some people there were degrees in terms of what people knew so so actually the the the, the physicality of the sexual abuse um and again i've got to be aware of, of benchmarks and boundaries here because for some people who are into that scene it would seem fine it just wasn't my scene and that's where the importance of no has to come in well it's about a lot it's about consensual sex isn't it absolutely precisely precisely and there are some elements where i can look back and say well i consented to that but i consented to it because i didn't want what would come if i didn't yes. consent to it so there's, there's that too there's coercion going on too but in in many ways that was the easiest part the more, the more difficult part was the emotional manipulation and the we talk about gaslighting now we didn't have that then yeah. I remember one particular occasion where a friend I'd used to work with had gone to live in London and was coming over to stay with us for a weekend. And she knew that, I guess we, we'd, we'd say that it could be a bit of an ass in that kind of friendly, let's just do a surface skim here. But I remember telling her to make sure she barricaded the door before she went to sleep, wow. before she slept in our spare room last, that night. And I remember that we went out with a group of friends and... He was a master manipulator. He could charm the birds from the trees. He had a lot of the traits that we would now link with, 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 with a sociopath. He could make everybody else think he was the darling of the room and mm. I would feel this big. And this one particular night when my friend had come over to stay, he could look at me and I'd, I'd, I knew I was in trouble. Everybody else, he was the life and soul. I knew I was in trouble. And he was speaking to everybody else to the exclusion of me but in a very clever way where nobody else would realize he was excluding me mm. and we walked along the street we we're going on a good old-fashioned pub crawl and he i remember him grabbing me by the arm quite forcefully and leaning over to anyone else it would look as though he was whispering sweet nothings mm -hmm. and watch what he actually said tonight is the only way you're getting out of this is if you make a pass out of your friend tonight and we all get to join you so this is so difficult you know this campaign is called spot the signs because um for those people that were on that pub call with you and your friends and your work colleagues, they literally would have found it really difficult to have spot, spotted the signs. They wouldn't have spotted the signs because I knew that for my own well-being, I needed to plaster on the smile. Yeah. And again, my friend would have known there was something going on. And I kind of made a joking, oh, he, he wants me to make a pass at you. He's got all that, all that going on. And we laughed it off because there's no way in a million years, because again, I'm a one person woman and be that's my friend you know in the, just the same way that if you're heterosexual you don't fancy every bloke yes yeah i don't tend to have friendships with 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 women whose, whose bones are wanted to jump that would just be a bit odd for me yeah. um and so she would have known there was something going on and that his behavior was odd because i had said put something up against the door tonight because i don't trust him yeah and there were occasions where when when the when the physical aspects became more unbearable i remember going to work one day and I was I was news editor, but my best mate at the time was one of the other reporters. And I remember I'd, I'd gone out to the to the to the back the, the kind of storage area behind the newsrooms, and I was in some discomfort. I don't remember what had happened the night before, but I was in some physical discomfort, and I was also feeling deep deep shame at how I could allow someone to do that to me and willingly allow that to happen. And I remember sitting with my knees up and I was crying. And she came and found me and asked what was wrong. And I said, he didn't, he didn't understand the word, the word no last night. Mm. But it still wasn't taken seriously because to everyone else, he was such a charmer. He was the life and soul. And so I dropped hints as much as I could. That's, that's heavier than a hint, really, isn't it? That, that's essentially <laughs> saying marital rape. Yeah, yeah. Or cohabital rape, whatever the term would be. Um, but again, it still wasn't taken seriously because, again, I think because of the area I lived in, there would have been a small, it, it, there was a, it was a village on the outskirts of a, a mining town, lots of farming communities. And I, I suspect a lot, of the, a lot of the attitude would still have been, well, it's a wife's duties and you can't have that kind of thing when you're living with somebody. It doesn't mm. happen. Mm. doesn't count. Mm. So... What, what's interesting how 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 many years ago was this i mean i'm just really curious as to know to whether or not you know our culture has changed whether or not this would if this had taken place now so how many years ago was this you're talking 20 plus years ago 20. i mean asher and i have been together for 22 years so no, that, gives, yeah, you a, that gives you an idea a long time ago 
So in your experience, do you think that if this had happened now and you'd have been in that storeroom crying, that you would have got a different reaction from your friend? Would you have behaved differently? I would hope so. Mm. Yes, I would hope so. The only time I went into any graphic detail about what happened was was when I left and we had a house together. So there was the usual, we had to get solicitors involved and it got very mess, messy. And in fact, I had to go into hiding because he also, he also had done some legal, some not so legal. And it did get very threatening. There were death threats involved to, toward oh. the end. Um, and of course, then I, I was asked to write a detailed report of everything that had happened. And I remember that was the first time that I'd properly shared because I was able to take that massive cathartic several sheets of A4 that the solicitor wanted and show that to my mum and said, this is what's been going How on. did your mum cope with that? Um, she, she w my mum had a good relationship with him. So I can look back and feel that it was quite dismissive. I think she dealt with it as best she possibly could with the tools that she had. Yeah. My mum's a wonderful, giving human being. I don't know what's in her past. Yeah. Um, I think she dealt with it as best as she could with the tools that she had. In fact, I, I'd tried leaving once before. Um, and I'd gone back to my parents' house. And I'd said to her, I can't take the calls because I knew I would not be strong enough to stay away if I took the calls. There was such a level. I, I'd lost so much of myself, Jill. Yeah. You, know, you wouldn't believe it was the same. If you knew me then, you wouldn't, you wouldn't believe this was the same woman. Um, and there was so much emotional tie, so much emotional manipulation, so much needless guilt that I knew if I heard that voice, I would go back. I could, I could know that he'd been terribly abusive. I could know that he'd been terribly manipulative and cruel. And yet I'd look at him, he'd put that face on, and I'd just see a little schoolboy in long shorts who needed to be taken care of. And it's really so, interesting, isn't it? Because I think a lot of people who haven't suffered any abuse, that you know the, the usual question is but why did she go back why is she still there why yeah. haven't she got out and you know that's what i really want love that you're able to kind of explain to people that it's the shame and the guilt and the embarrassment presumably as well and also well, the love that you had yes the, yes the there was still love there. Yeah. i still i still i'm not in love with him but i still have care there now i don't believe you can spend that much of your life with someone and not care on yeah. some level um, and the, the, the night that I left the first time, I remember we'd been at a charity function and there were family members at this charity function. And I had told my best friend and some family members that I was going to leave yeah. that night because I knew that if I told people that I was going to leave, I had to be accountable and my own sense of worth wouldn't allow me to not do it. So I told some people I was going to leave and I left. And I remember saying to my mum, please if he wants to call i can't speak to him I, i'm not strong enough to stay away if i speak to him so of course he called and she passed me the phone and then i said please don't let him come around if he comes around I, I won't be able to stay away and i need to stay away and he came around and i said please if he's going to come around please don't leave us in the room me. together on our own please don't leave me on my own with him i won't be able to stay away and he turned up and she went i'll leave you two together then and i was strong enough to stay away that night but i went back the next day Mm. so these are some real lessons for you know the people that might be listening to this uh you know one of the reasons i'm uh i'm interested in the, the missing of these signs and missing of the verbal clues that are, yeah. you know they're not only clues they're you know they're instructions <laughs> do not do this you know yeah um you know i've got um some relatives of mine and and one of them has a daughter who is is going through some abuse at the moment and i kind of picked it up through just what i'd seen on facebook but her uncle is completely unaware and is still kind of going well i can't believe this is happening you know a to somebody that i know and somebody in my family but you know how, how can this very sensible bright girl um but actually it's it's not even reading between the lines that you're talking about it's actually that you were making it very clear and there was still yeah. that that kind of barrier from somebody rest not rest yeah well rescuing you coming to your aid and being on your side yeah she thought she was doing the best that she could but yeah. but again we have to remember the level the level of charm here yeah. <laughs> you know, 
I was, I was almost going to say the Dharma charm. That would be unfair. He wasn't Jeffrey Dharma at all. Um, but I remember after I'd left, even after I'd confided in some work colleagues in terms of what was going on, a couple of them had said, well, they felt sorry for him because he was a nice bloke, really. Yeah. So hold on, I've just told you that all this was that, which of course then created more doubt for me in that very unstable mode I was in at the time. Yeah. That created more doubt for me. Well, am I making it up? Am I being frigid? Is this normal? Am I just bizarre? And that again you know? is very common, isn't it? Yes, of course. And it's why people get stuck into the cyclical going back into an abusive relationship. Mm. We, we get stuck in. I'm so glad that didn't happen for me. And that, you know, I was able to meet someone that I, I'm still deeply in love with to this day. Who's absolutely my heart mate, my soul mate. I can't imagine living living without, but she had would would have done a lot of holding and helping me put the pieces back together. And I swear that I talk a lot about my um my breakdown, and I think one of the reasons I hit a breakdown so many years later is because I hadn't dealt with it. And yeah. of course, also in 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 terms of how bad did it get, how bad it got for me was that when I didn't believe. I didn't believe I'd have the strength to leave. Before I tried to leave, I tried to leave Earth. You know, I tried, I tried to die. I didn't want to classically commit suicide, if you can classically commit suicide, and leave that for, for my loved ones. So I deliberately took as many risks as I could in, a, in an attempt to die, which culminated in me writing off my car and breaking my back in three places. Was that before you left him then? Yeah. Mm. That was before I left. Well, if that's not a cry for help, what else is? <laughs> well, it was just somebody driving like an idiot. Nobody could see. I was the risk taker. I like to do these high octane thrill seeking things. Yeah. But then I can look back and know the reason that I wanted to do all the thrill seeking stuff is that it was absolute freedom. And I was handing my life over to a higher power for a moment. And if I was meant to be alive at the end of it, well, that was okay. And that filtered through even into work things like. I put myself forward for craziest things, the most mundane being things like first try, try and paintballing when it first came out, right through to doing loop the loops in a light aircraft, to volunteering to do, go and do a feature on being in a circus act and having knives thrown at me. To everyone else, it was me being a thrill seeker. To me, it was escape and I just might die this time. Yeah, and you didn't value yourself. It wasn't that I didn't value myself, it's that I didn't understand how I could possibly fit into this world. Uh -huh. I still always valued myself and I always valued other people I know there were I frequently had a curfew even if we had work events I'd have a curfew to the point where my, and that was another sign wasn't it and yet again my best workmate would just take the piss out of the fact that I had a curfew to be back for or I'd be in trouble yes you know but if I knew that one of my friends was in danger or upset I'd stay with them and break curfew and no, no I'd really get it in the net when I got home so I would put other people above me and I still had enough. I, th this is a weird one. I didn't so much lose my sense of value as lose my sense of self. I didn't know who I was, but I still had enough wherewithal to know that I deserved more than this. So when I wanted to die, it wasn't about not having self-worth. It was about not understanding how there could possibly be another escape. Ah. And again, that's where the 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 deep bone deep knowledge somewhere that i was gay was tapping into it because that was so unacceptable yeah. so not only was i in an abusive relationship not only was i losing my sense of self not only was i deeply unhappy on antidepressants then but i was also wrong so even though you went to your doctor and you were on antidepressants you didn't tell him what was going on her him no no and I remember going home and speaking to, to said other half that I'd, been, that I'd been diagnosed with clinical depression. And his immediate response was, well, what, how do you think that makes me look? Mm. And when I broke my back, because I didn't go to hospital straight away, I insisted that I was fine. Went to work. My editor took me to and from the pub, mile, mile and a half to get me a stiff brandy. I'd been walking round on a broken back. Wow. And... It wasn't until the afternoon when the adrenaline calmed. I thought, oh, that's a bit sore. And <laughs> that's a bit of an understatement. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Hospital, flatbed, head packed in sandbags, lay there for nine hours before somebody told me what was going on. 
And when I called home to say the doctor wants me to go to hospital, the response was, well, my dinner's not going to be on the table when I go home then. Mm. And that, of course, then when it got to the point where they could say, well, she's broken her back in three places, she came in, lifted oh, me up, swept me up. Yeah, but then once he was out of eyeshot, dumped me on the back seat and took great pleasure in going at speed over the speed bumps. Yeah. <laughs> you know. So how, what happened in the end? Was, is there, was there a kind of pivotal moment? Was it a kind of slow burn? How did you extract yourself? And what, what does this look like? You know, I know that every, every person's story is different. Hmm. But what did it look like for you in terms of the, the kind of the, fine, the final bit of it, you know, and the fact that you left? Hmm. You know, how did you, how were you able to do that? Um, I started going to martial arts um, lessons and that was okay because I could go on a weekend and he was off doing his thing he'd never want to spend time with me he'd, uh -huh. he'd, he'd, he would say he had no time for me but then his brother would call and suddenly have time you know so my time to keep house to go and get the shopping and to do something for me was at the weekend so I went, I went back into to martial art lessons I joined the Shotokan Karate Club got really good won an award I had my trophy in the window which he was happy to let people think that was his trophy, of course. <laughs> um, and that started to build my confidence. Starting to get more physically fit started to build my confidence. Um, he had a string of affairs, or at least I believe he had a string of affairs. Um, I never had proof, but I'm pretty sure it happened. He told me that he wanted to ride up into the sunset with somebody else. I wish I'd just taken that off for when he first <laughs> came up with it. But that's where my sense of pride kicked in. I went, no. So he met somebody on a course and said he would fall in love and I'll give you this amount of money and you can just leave and we'll split. And my sense of pride at that point went, no, this is mine. Why didn't I take that? Anyway. Well, you didn't have a sense of self, as you say. No, yeah. no, absolutely. So the mar throwing myself into martial arts really, really helped. Um, I met Asher before we were actually in a relationship because again, I'm, I'm not one for, for, yeah. for crossover. There was, there was a lot of emotional crossover that was probably going to happen until I'd left. Um, so that gave me the confidence to go. Um, the fact that people had not taken me seriously when I'd tried to leave the first time and start, the, the strength that I was building and the sense of confidence I was building through meeting a new set of friends and through doing the martial arts made me start to realise I was worth, worth more than that and I just couldn't live in that mould anymore. Mm. Um, and I moved all of my things out of the house systematically over about a, per over a period of about a month and he didn't notice I'm told he only noticed when he went in after I'd actually gone I noticed that the bookshelf opposite the door was empty because he didn't read so my I had no I was having to there were some days I'd have to go from home in my pajamas to my parents house to get some clothes because I'd taken too much away wardrobes were empty and he hadn't noticed and he hadn't but, noticed no no not at all We'd had a few arguments. I'd said things like, you don't care for me anymore. You don't even know what perfume I wear. You don't give me any gifts, which of course it shouldn't be about that. Mm -hmm. I came home one night to find that there was a box of my perfume in the middle of the room, which he'd got his grandma to go and buy. Too little, too late. Mm -hmm. And on the day, I remember on the day I actually left, for once I instigated an argument because I felt I needed, if there was an argument, I felt I'd feel strong enough to leave. Mm. and the last thing he said on that day before he left the house was why can't you wash the pots wearing a stockings and suspenders like my mum hmm. which says quite a lot it does say a lot yeah and then because it had got to that point and because I'd already I'd been to see a solicitor to say how can I extract myself from this then I didn't take the phone calls this time I didn't take them every time there was I, I, I think I left, listened to like half a word and I'd just hit delete because, again, even though I had a sense of self, although my confidence was coming back, I knew there was a new life waiting for me. I still didn't believe, didn't trust myself to stay away if I allowed the guilt to kick in. So I didn't listen to any of the messages. I deleted all of them. I went into a hi into hiding in a different part, different part of the country for quite a few weeks. Um, and that was enough. That got me out so you, of there. you didn't need the women's refuge type scenario. You had yeah. somewhere to go. I had people I could go to. Yeah, and I did that. But what made it more difficult was when I did finally come back to work. I, I was at the same place before I before I moved to a different part of the country. 
my manager thought it was quite funny to tell me that she'd seen a bloke sitting outside of the door looking up at my window with and described described a car which could have been his with a can of beer in his hand and he'd been sitting staring at the window and she thought that was highly amusing wow and so that was one of my nudges to think i don't feel safe here not because of what she'd said but the level of fear that put into me yes told me that i really needed a fresh start yes and so i found a job closer to where ash was living and moved over there and the rest as i say is history so in terms of you know what what's happening in the moment i mean i know we're now in i don't know we're being alert or something whatever we're being <laughs> <laughs> unless you're dominic but anyway <laughs> listen to these alerts yeah, um, yeah. You know, when I first started doing this, we were definitely in lockdown. And of course, we knew that um, particularly violence against women, you know, the death rate went up yeah. for women and children, actually, in the first three yeah. weeks. Yeah. Um, can you imagine for you what it would have been like, you know, when it was at its worst and you would have been in lockdown with this man? Do you think about um, that? I don't know. Yeah, I have thought about that. And I don't know how I would have survived that because my only bit of freedom and my bit of escape was to just go and get in my car and drive at speed round round windy country lanes, you know, in the the back alleys of Leicestershire and Derbyshire and Staffordshire, wherever wherever I could find the windiest country single track lanes. Yeah. And that's where I'd let go, you know, music up high, windows open, and if I died, I died. But that was my sense of freedom. Um, I don't know how I would have survived survived that because I don't know how he would have reacted to that he would not have been happy which means i suspect he would have become more and more extreme with his demands and with his behavior maybe it would have turned into more physical abuse than i don't know and i feel for people going through that so much because yeah there are phone lines there are things like the code we talked about earlier with with the hearts where you can send text to people but the level of control i was under i probably wouldn't have been safe to do that I had a mobile phone, he didn't. If he needed a mobile phone, he would demand that he could borrow mine. Yeah. Of course, I didn't think about it that way at the time, but that meant he had complete control over my communication. So I don't know, and I don't know what we can do. It's all right saying there are websites, there are phones, but if the level of control is that great, people won't have access to a website or to a mobile phone. And so all we can say is we really need to urge people to be far more vigilant and to look beneath the surface if somebody's displaying erratic behavior if somebody wants to take all those thrills like i did sometimes it's not just about having a sense of excitement mm. if somebody drops hints and says they're unhappy if somebody says they're okay and you know they're not then ask them again and create a safe enough space and if you are in any doubt then call and get the police sent around there I, I, I would rather somebody feel foolish and risking a friendship for making an accusation that isn't true than have someone risking severe pain or even death we do know that and this is in one of the other causes that crime stoppers are um accepting calls from people you don't even have to give your name yeah um you know you can do it all anonymously so if you suspect that this is happening to somebody that you know whether it's a child or a, pet or a woman or a man you can phone crime stoppers um and it's about really putting putting a household on the radar isn't it yeah, yeah. Uh, creating even if even if you say you, you you're not really sure it's better that they're on the radar because if that moment comes when that woman for example needs to phone 999 because it's escalated because of the circumstances we're in the, the police will have a record yeah. and that house will be flagged and that yeah. means that that will be a priority call for them is that that's yeah. correct isn't it's it so important it's so important and the other thing that's really important for people who come through the other side of abuse and this is something that i'm so keen to stress when i do I sometimes run some of my empowerment seminars that have been bespokely built for people who've been through abuse. I've done it in association with, with some of the, the, the local authorities. I really encourage people not to refer to themselves as victims or survivors. Mm -hmm. Because the second we identify as a victim of abuse, it keeps us in that energy. 
-hmm. if we identify as i don't care what destiny's child said if you if you call yourself a survivor that also holds you in that energy and we can come into this kind of brickle anger mode where we angrily say i've survived this this is my identity but it stops us from being able to step into a new identity it stops us from fulfilling our potential and it means we're always caught in that mold so i would say yes these can be desperately terrifying painful breaking times but once you're out the other side think about everything else that you've survived have you ever had deli belly well you don't call yourself a victim of deli belly or a deli belly survivor do you mm -hmm. you know so just think about the words that you use and try not to use it try not to wear it as, as a medal or even as a brand yeah so a badge it's part of your past yeah you you can learn from it as part of your past but make sure you don't identify as that because you are so so much more and what's really interesting, and I think you've identified this really clearly, is that, you know, your experience, I believe that we're all on this earth, and I know you do, uh, because our experiences actually um, are, are pivotal in what we end up doing and serving and how we yep. behave in the world. And of course, you know, Taz Thornton wouldn't be Taz Thornton, the brand that you are, the badge that you wear now. Yeah. Um, yep if you hadn't have had all of these experiences, because as you say, Absolutely. one area of your work, which is these empowerment seminars that you do, you know, none of that would be as impactful if you- Absolutely, experience absolutely. It. I'm deeply grateful for everything I've experienced in my life, including that. So yeah. is where my whole thing about being able to flip your negatives comes from. So very quickly, the first one of those empowerment, what the bespoke ones that I ran, I remember people coming in and it happened to be all women. It's not women only because abuse happens to anyone across the gender spectrum and across the sexuality spectrum. Um, but I remember that everybody filing in and at first they kind of got their arms crossed and they were looking at me like, what's she going to teach me? What does she know? But when I started to tell my story, gradually their arms unfolded and they sat further forwards in their seats. Mm. And that work changed lives that day. We don't have time to go into to some of the stories, but some of them were desperately life changing. One one lady had been kept drugged and locked in a room, and by, when she turned up, she was severely agoraphobic. And by lunchtime, she walked into town to get a sandwich, which is we take for granted. Yeah, <laughs> but that's another thing. Don't compare. Please don't compare. When you hear all, all of us coaches saying things and Tony Robbins saying like things like take massive action. Yeah, do that. But recognize that it's subjective. Massive action on that day for that lady was walking into town to get a sami. Yeah. So so that lady has an extraordinary tale to tell and an extraordinary example to other women that, you know, have are potentially going through or have been through what she's been through. Yeah. So it's all all the same. We are all part of that same that yeah. same thing. Um, yeah. it's just that some of us or like you have been able to kind of I mean what's really clear is that even though you were in this in your 20s you know you still had this awareness you still kind of knew what was going on and that, and that awareness has stayed with you the whole time that you've been able to build whole programs around mm. yeah Which the awareness was always there and I think a, a lot of that comes from my 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 spiritual beliefs I'd always had an awareness of there being more and I think somewhere on some level I knew that I would be okay and regardless of whether I had a physical body or not yeah I felt that there was more and that there was something else to look after me and that that, that I'd be okay and I'm not talking about you know a, a faith with a capital F or organized religion but just a deep knowing that there was more to life than the physical existence and somehow that got me through and it's it's like that, that my whole unleash your awesome catchphrase it kind of comes from there because it was when I started going back into to those those karate lessons and building up my self-esteem and building up my confidence that it was only a tiny little spark but there was a spark and I noticed that spark and I was able to coax that spark into a flame as much as it sounds like a cliche I found that pot of awesome that was always in me, mm. but that had been, it hadn't even been eroded. It had been squashed and covered up, but it's always there for all of us. There's always a spark and we know there's always a spark because if there's no spark, we're dead. So if we're alive, there's a spark and we all have the ability to find it. 
yeah, it's sometimes that, it's bloody yeah, hard. I, I heard it described the other day as it's a, it's about your soul, your soul that you enter this world with. Your soul stays with you. It might get lost along the way for whatever reason, but actually, what you need to be able to do is to reconnect with that soul or that that awesomeness and, and acknowledge that if we do believe we, that we have a soul that moves through different lifetimes, some of the things we come we we come here in a physical existence in order to get lessons that we need corporeal form for so on some level before i came into this earth suit i probably said oh i've never experienced abuse i need to understand that i need to i need to be squashed right down to nothing and learn how to rebuild at which point some other soul said okay i'll come down and teach you that yeah you know? so there's different ways to look there are at very it. different ways to look at it aren't there and you know with the, the kind of um awakening process you know that might sound really barking in advance to a lot of people and really out yeah, it might sound really woo for some you know really? but so what yeah. yeah yeah absolutely but it's your reality and it's it very much you know what my understanding is of the way that we are you know as as we're all going through this journey and thank god the older i get the more understanding i have of it you know, it's yeah. a great thing about being you know that in in my wisdom years is these are the wonderful things that happen to you um so you know what i what i want to be able to do taz is i think you've been wonderful in giving people an insight into how this can happen to an intelligent um capable strong woman albeit that you were young at the time yeah uh, that i think i was born at 40 though jill to <laughs> <laughs> people say that to you do you? we got old bones yeah but that you know hopefully now uh, 20 years later we would hope that the landscape has changed we certainly hope in the workplace that you know those comments that your boss made you know about somebody sitting outside the car was so completely unacceptable now wouldn't happen so even though we would hope that this situation would not happen again we know in reality that it is yeah. Taz, what I do know is that you and I agree on a lot of things in that, you know, with this mad situation that we're in, that there's a lot of fear being created and there's an awful lot of nosiness going on and people making judgments about what's happening next door with their neighbours and people on the beach. And, you know, I just have just been saying, you know, to myself, just mind your own business, you know, yeah. as long as you're safe and you're doing what you think is the right thing to do. But on this occasion, I think this is the opposite of that i think we need to stop minding our own business would you agree yeah i absolutely agree and i think the other thing to bear in mind is that for people going through this we need you need to acknowledge that if it matters to you it matters yeah that's all there is to it so so forget comparing forget whether you know forget whether you have benchmarks all that daft stuff i went through stayed there for probably too long not because everything unfolds as it should i believe but I stayed there for longer than I perhaps needed to because I was looking for benchmarks. I was comparing. I didn't know if it was just me being weird. So just remember that if it matters to you, it matters. And if you are looking in on anyone and you're not sure, even if it's just a gut feel, again, I'd rather risk looking silly than risk leaving somebody to, to suffer unnecessarily. Yes. Yeah. And, and that's I, I, love, I love that if it matters to you. That's just such wonderful advice. Okay. So uh, Taz, around this video and on the podcast, um, I'm going to create links so that we know how to get in contact with you uh, specifically because you do have your empowerment. Um, and, and there's all sorts of programs that you do in your Unleash Your Awesome brand as well that, you know, maybe some of these people that are coming out of abuse or that have had experienced abuse as a child as well, because that abuse yeah. stays with you. You know, I know a lot of your pro programs will address former trauma and, you know, PTSD and all that kind of thing. So yeah. um, bless you. Thank you for your time today and being so honest and open, which I of course knew you would be. Thank you for inviting me. It's, a, it's my pleasure always. Thanks, Jim. Thank you. Uh, take very good care. You too.